And they said one of the strongest motivations in school is avoidance motivation. Why would you avoid? If there's a drive to succeed, why would you avoid? You avoid as a way of protecting yourself. I used to say just from failure, but now I add humiliation. No one wants to be humiliated. Oh, by the way, every one of us in this room has used avoidance motivation. I'll give you a simple example. I bet almost all of you have all our ID on your phones. In the last two, three months, I don't want to speak to that person. Avoid this motivation. If any of you ever procrastinated, avoid this motivation. My wife knows I'm not very handy. So I found the best solution is when something breaks in the house, you know what I say? Call someone. One time my car wouldn't start. I foolishly picked up the hood. My wife was very well and direct. She said, why? Because <laughs> she knew I didn't have the foggiest idea. We all use it. But I don't want this to be just seem like words because at the next time you're discussing your kid, instead ask this. Rather than asserting that students are lazy or motivated, they don't care. Why? What if we ask this question? How do we lessen avoidance motivation in children and adolescents who use it? So I got an email from the school social worker. She said, I took your workshop, your all day workshop, three months ago about dealing with angry, challenging students who came just in the nick of time. The very next day, my school principal called me in. I actually thought this was punishment for taking a workshop. He said, now that you know how to deal with angry, challenging kids after one workshop, here's a list of the five kids in the school with the worst attendance and behavior problems. Your job is not only to get them in, they must behave. And then she said, my first thought, mission impossible. My next thought was the cartoon you showed up, the obsessive compulsive kid who's being punished by doing the very thing he loves to do. And she said, guess what the main form of punishment is for these kids who dislike school? Suspension. We're suspending kids who don't want to be there. She said, why do we do this? And so all I can think about is what you wrote. I want to show you how one school social worker within one week totally redirected the lives of five very vulnerable kids. She called these empty kids in and she said, yesterday the principal gave me a very important job. He's trying to understand why kids want to go to school. Empty me or don't want to go to school. I thought of it all night. It's much too big a job for one person. I need a committee of experts. I checked the record. You five may be very good. <laughs> you know what one of them actually said? We may be the best you have. <laughs> now this could be a gimmick, but let's see what you know. She said, how are we going to study this? You can do this in JavaScript. Maybe every kid should fill out a form like this at some point. Two, three reasons I like to go to school, two, three reasons I don't want to change things. She gets their answer. She says, let's get more data. I couldn't believe she did this. She arranged for them to interview the superintendent of school, school board members, teachers, parents, school administrators, you name it. Now they have a lot of data. They put together a report. <laughs> I love one of their recommendations. Do not wait to fifth or sixth grade to address the significant problems. Some kids hate school well before then. <laughs> and you know what the recommendation was? This ad hoc committee would become a permanent standing committee meeting every day after school. Now this is brilliant. Now they have to be in school because they have a committee meeting. But even this could be a gimmick. What did they do? <laughs> During the day, every first grade teacher in that school district sent his other attendance sheets to the committee. They poured over the attendance sheets. Any first grader who's had a certain number of days, would anyone in this room like to guess who wants to speak to them about the importance of school? One of these five kids. She said, I waited five, three months to write to you. I can't believe what's happening. In the three months now, one of these kids has been out one day, we have not had one behavior problem. There's a new keynote I give, which is actually a comment that other ones made to me. It's called, We Must Stop Punishing Suffering Children. You know what our real goal is? We should be always asking, do I help every child feel dignified in my presence? And let me read to you one of the most amazing letters I have ever received. A couple of years ago, I was an opening day speaker. My, my little son is in Portland, Maine, but I had to check out the map where Fulton, Maine is. Some of you know, may know where it is. It is like near the New Brunswick border. I said, this will be fine. I'll stop off at my son's in the Portland area, see the grandkids, and then drive. And I drove. And I drove. It is the way I did. I get this letter from this teacher. His name, he told me I could use his name, Dwayne D-W-A-Y-N-E Morse. I'm an English 
teacher at the end of each school day, I have a class of vocational students. For many of the students, my class is course the only two traditional class and course they have. These are kids who love to cook well, fabricate, and build with their hands. One of my jobs was actually to help them to write essays. Some are applying to the vocational schools, some to community colleges. They said, I got them started, they said they would be working on it all week. And when I asked them at the end of the week to bring out what they had done, I couldn't believe the utter lack of progress and sophistication in their work. I really blew it. I said, what have you been doing sitting in my class all week and this is what you have to show for it? I clearly embarrassed the class. And one red-faced boy quickly shot his hand up and looked at me and said, writing is hard for us, it's easy for you. We're not English teachers. But I can change the grade scores on your G in 15 minutes. How long do you think it would take you? <laughs> After hearing him, I said, please put away your essays. I realized I had really blown it. When they walked in on Monday, there was a 12 inch by 14 inch color photo hanging on the wall of me working on my G. <laughs> The kid said, what are you doing? I spent the weekend putting on new breaks. How long did it take you? I smiled, I said I was so scared to death, it took me over six hours. They laughed even louder. When the room quieted down, I told them for as long as I was a teacher, I would keep that picture hanging proudly on my wall. <clears throat> when they asked why, I simply told them that I had forgotten how hard it is to do something far and challenging. I then apologized to them for being an ass and long with them for the week before. And I saw if they asked, how many of you would let me really walk you through with as much time as you need to write those essays? Every hand went up with a smile. Two weeks later, 18 seemingly unmotivated, unmotivated students were extremely proud of the work they had done, and I would learn a wonderful lesson. I will say this to all of you. 50 years from now, if we found these students and said, what was one of the best memories you have at school? They'll say there's this crazy teacher, Mr. Morris, who actually had the courage to apologize to us and really had the courage to understand what we were going through. It's a very powerful thing. And by the way, there's an Einstein quote that really uh, captures uh, this. Everybody is a genius, but if we judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will have to live it its whole life and believe that it's stupid. But you know what the problem is? Before I get to the theory of motivation, I use too many people are afraid to think outside the box. You know, we get so used to a certain pattern, how we've been doing things, and we get stuck. We don't do what a Mr. Morris does, or that attendance committee does. And a teacher said to me the following, many of you may have seen this video clip, of sometimes the solution is right in front of us and we don't see it.
Whether I work with you, coaches, parents, teachers, school administrators, business people, I'm often asked, how do you motivate people? See, I, I often will ask, what's your theory of motivation? When I first started in the field, most of my initial publications are behavior modification and points, you know, systems, whatever. I think they're very limited. So what I want to go over it, and I'm, this is to be a very quick overview. If you go to my website, there are a number of articles on a coin I term called motivating environments. What I mean by this is how do you create an environment in your classroom, your school, where everyone wants to be, both staff and kids. And the person whose work I greatly respect and whose model I use is a psychologist at the University of Rochester, New York. His name is Edward Easy. So let me at least give you an overview, and I, and I hope if you're interested, you'll read more about it. He developed a, a form of, or a theory called self-determination theory. Edward D.C., very similar in terms of positive emotions, Edward D.C. might say, our first job is not to teach reading or science or second or third grade. Of course, that's what it is. But the first job we have, starting on day one, is to create an environment where every kid feels safe and secure and wants to learn from us. Now that could be a platitude, a throwaway line. Why DC has won countless awards from educational and psychological organizations is he then asks this question. How do you make people feel safe and secure? And what he says is every child, and but I will add every staff member, when we come into a school or any environment, we have certain basic needs. When a school systematically meets these needs, you can predict almost in advance that kids are going to want to learn from you. If you don't meet these, you're going to have problems. So what he's saying is don't worry about teaching math right away or the reading. First grade environment where kids are going to be hungry to learn from you. So he said there were three basic needs. Any of you know, you know the work of William Glasser, a psychiatrist who died a few years ago. He wrote Reality Therapy in the Quality School. His views are very similar. Let me, in the last 15, 20 minutes, at least give you a sense of when I come into a school or any organization and I interview people, these are the needs I want to see met. I always <laughs> put this one first, not that DC does. Because it's a relationship. You always find you putting a relationship first. The need to belong and feel connected. DC says, why should anyone want to be in a school if they really don't feel connected or belonging to the school? And then I read this article written by a teacher that said, teachers who spend less time going over, over every rule and regulation of the school and more time asking this question. How do I make every child feel welcome in my presence? I love that word, welcome. There was this there was an educator, Perky, who used to talk about invitational schools. So you know what I decided to do? I wonder what makes people feel welcome. I know what makes me feel welcome, but as I was visiting different schools when students were there, I started asking kids between the ages of four and a half and 19, what could a teacher, school administrator do every day when they help you feel welcome here? I got many answers, but it was amazing whether it was four and a half or 19. Two answers kept coming up. Jay, this is going to add so much to your budget. <laughs> one was, greet me by name. Would anyone like to guess what the other one was? I'm sorry. Smile. This is urging. And you know what's really funny? Years ago, some of you may be old enough to remember this, teachers were actually taught to not smile the first couple of months of school. You know what? If you smile, the kids may take advantage of you. Is that <laughs> the biggest? Anyway. Smile. Kids notice whether you smile. I had one middle school kid who told me about going to the school when I met one of his teachers. Tell a joke. I said, why? He said, because she won't smile. I said, what do you mean she won't smile? He says, she can't. <laughs> I said, what do you mean she can't? And then I heard one of the greatest lines in my 40 year career. I think she has paralysis of the mouth. <laughs> After I met her, I thought she had paralysis in the <laughs> One principal heard this, and there's a principal, what an honest guy. He writes me two months later, he says, I realized I was not a very welcoming principal. And <laughs> he said both for the kids and his staff. I realized I was one of those principals often in my office. So he said I changed with just one thing, and the whole tenor of my school has changed. You know what it was? He stands by the door, and he said, I started shaking kids' hands. 
He said at first they didn't know what the hell I was doing, the English language. They thought I was giving them the disease because they were actually rubbing their hand afterwards. <laughs> and then he said after a while, if I missed a kid, they came back. And soon the teachers were doing similar things. He said it's only been two months, and after two months, attendance has gone up, discipline problems have gone down. You know what I would love you to do because I don't have time now. It's that meeting or just in a small group. Discuss what helps you to feel well. Because you know, I've had teachers privately to tell me that they don't feel well in their own school. Yep. How the kids end though? This one high school kid said the biggest clicks at the school sometimes are the teachers. Everyone should feel welcome. So I'd welcome kids if you don't feel part of the group, if you will. And no child should ever feel alone. It's very powerful. One of my favorite books, I used to say for coaches, but it's for like a uh, season of life. It's about the story of Jordan and professional football player. Now there's a lot of workshops and coaching. In that beautiful book, you know what he had his high school students do? If they ever saw a kid in the, in the cafeteria sitting by himself or herself, you know what they did? They went over to invite the kid to join them at their table. Because Jordan said, no student should be sitting by himself or herself. Very powerful. It's very tough when you feel alone. Think about how you kids, and if you want many more examples, I collected hundreds, the simplest things that make a kid feel welcome and that they truly belong. And I know I'm going over this fairly quickly, but just to really think about this and have discussions about it. I don't know, by the way, I, I, I must have... I came back here in the middle of the year. You know what I first of all ask all of you? What choices or decisions do you feel you make about your own work? Now, none of us has total control. I once read an article by a teacher who said, focus on your wiggle room. All I can think about was all of this. If anyone comes to work every day and feels they are told what to do and have absolutely no say, it actually affects your immune system. So we all want to feel we have children. And so if I came back and the kids were here, you know what I love to ask kids? What choices have you had in this classroom? And I'm not talking about anything earth shaking. One study DC did, could you tell me why this works? He went to a high school, one group of high school kids, and they gave a choice. They said you could do homework A or B. They were basically variations of a theme. Another group, they did not give the choice. Now, even though I believe in choice, let me tell you, I said that's not that going to really make a difference. The group that I was given the choice of doing A or B did more work, did more effectively, and you know what else they found? They judged the teachers to be more caring and concerned about their learning because they gave them the choice. And you have to use the word. It's your choice. By the way, speak for the parents in the room. Don't do that. It's your choice. Do you want to take a bath first or do you work first? You want to do this first or this first? You want to do this or I kill you? But at least you give them a choice. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. See, this has to do with ownership. Teacher Magazine, one of my favorite magazines years ago, had an article where they looked at what would happen if starting in kindergarten, even for just part of the meeting, kids attended parent-teacher conferences. You know what they found? The kids were much more motivated to learn, even if they were just there for a few minutes. Two years later, there was a follow-up. They decided to do this. What if you ask kids to run the meetings? Now, let's be honest. We didn't say, make you run the meeting, but you know what they found? If a child was to run the meeting, they would allow the teacher to more closely go over the child's learning style and things like this, and what questions to ask. And guess what? The kids did much better in school. Because we all want to feel a sense of ownership. Let me get to discipline. Remember before I talked about disciplinarian? I think no kid should be greeted the first day of school with uh, countless rules in a room. You know why? Because I learned the hard way. One of the best ways for kids to follow rules is it's within reason they help to create them. I've been writing about how I reorganized the first two or three days of school to follow some of this model. They found this. Kids came up with rules very similar to the teachers. But you know what they also found? If they helped to create the rules within reason, they were more likely to follow them. I gotta tell you, as I visit many schools, whether they realize it or not, I think what some schools really want us kids to be obedient and compliant. I don't know how this is gonna sound. I think we're very blessed to live in a democracy with all its problems. 
I don't want to be in compliant kids. I want kids to understand why they lose. I want them to participate there. I want them to be involved in the consequences. Obedience and compliance for me have very little to do with democracy. Because you know what happens when kids feel rules are being shoved down their throat? You know what the easiest thing is? To spit them right back out. But the very essence for me of discipline is to promote self-discipline or self-control, which means ownership of your own rules. I want them to understand that. These you found when you did this, those schools, the kids were more motivated and respectful and self-disciplined. And we have to think of that. Some teachers say, but I'm giving up too much authority. If I could do this in a locker room unit of a psychiatric hospital, you could do it anywhere. You don't give up authority. You have kids take greater responsibility. And the third need is really a, a favorite of mine for many years. I can't believe in 1981 I said the following, I cite areas of strength. And this is what, if I, if I take back, any school I come back to, you know what I ask people to do, and I know it's not always easy, so at least to think it is, make a list of every kid, and next to it, would put down what that kid would say, his or her strength or on the competences. There's wonderful research, the Gallup poll, among others, both about student engagement and worker engagement, that found this. People will be more engaged if they feel that their strengths are being noticed and utilized. What I started saying is, how can we utilize strengths? There was one boy, a 10-year-old boy, who basically hit other kids, he was a real bully. But I asked him basically what he liked to do, and he thought he did very well. And he told me he loved to take care of his pet dog. You know what his principal made him? The pet monitor of the school. It was his job to go around to make sure the pets in the school were well taken care of. I couldn't believe his principal. He even made him a union card. 